to baby walk me through this <laughs> no you, it was not baby walk you did that you did it yeah, let's give it up to your daughters who are professionals and helped you so it's really all thanks to them I, but if i if i become suddenly addicted to this i'll you'll, you'll have to take credit <laughs> yes well at least i I have to be on Instagram all the time now. It's because of you. <laughs> well, you know, take healthy spurts and spaces away. But what's really yeah. cool about it is um, you get to, you know, directly speak to people that support your work and share things that you are doing. Or if you have um, a reading that's coming up or a project that you're really concerned with, like, that's a beautiful way to to already reach people who support you. There is someone who is currently on Instagram posing as you. So ah. I, I want everyone to go follow Rosa Danticat right now because <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, Ed Vige's, uh alter ego right now because someone else has her name. Um, but we, you can, you can, we can talk through that and I can make sure you, uh, we can get that other account erased and stuff. So um, in the meantime, welcome. Thank you. It's so wonderful to see you. Yeah. I miss you here in Little Haiti. I miss Little Haiti, I got to tell you. Um, but I'm really grateful to, you know, at least uh, be in a space where I can work on something creative and, and um, also something that's going to be a part of shifting culture and organizing in the efforts of Black women and, and um, the stories that we want to tell. So... I feel like this is right on time. This project um, is not forcing me to choose any one part of myself. So what I think has been really great is that I can bring the organizer, I can bring the writer, um, I can bring you know the social, light, uh, social person that I love to be into this space. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm just grateful that you agreed to do this. For those of you who, I'm gonna do a little quick introduction for, for folks who are tuning in. Um, and to give you a little bit of an idea, Edvige, right below your face, you're going to see a bunch of comments being shared. And these are people that are tuning in right now um, and saying hello. So everyone feel free to give. I think FOM is on here and it's Aiti Nankela. Ah, and someone is saying fix the video. <laughs> uh, oh, fix the video. And I see V. Yes, yeah, V is yeah. here. Um, uh, hey, hey, Dill is saying you've cradled so many young brown women with your words at Beach. So grateful for you. So this is what's really cool about this platform is that while we're speaking, you can be in direct um, communication and see kind of all the people that are, are responding and tuning in. So thank you, everyone who's joining us right now. Feel free to get your folks into the room. Let them know that this conversation is about to take place. My name is Aja Monet. I'm a poet and organizer. 
and I'm here representing V-Day and Voices, which is a project that we cre uh, are currently in the process of creating. It's a campaign as well as um, an art piece, but Voices is a new interdisciplinary performance arts project and campaign grounded in Black women's stories by V-Day to unify the vision of ending violence against women, cis women, trans women, and non-binary people across the African continent and the African diaspora. Our goal is to use art to embody and inspire solidarity making in our collective imagination. And today, I have the beautiful pleasure of being joined by Edvige Danteka, who is an incredible writer and storyteller um, in her own right. And this is a one conversation that's a part of an ongoing series um, that we, we decided to create called The Listening Tour, so that during this time we could be um, attentive and listening to Black women who use their voices in profound and life-changing ways. Um, so let me uh, introduce Edwige's uh, bio. So Edwige Danteka is the author of several books, including Breath, Eyes, Memory, Crick, Crack, The Farming of Bones and Everything Inside. She is the editor of The Butterfly's Way, Voices from the Haitian Diaspora in the United States and Haiti Noir and Haiti Noir II. She has written seven books for young adults and children. Um, is it Anna Koana? Behind Anna the Mountain. Uh, is that, did I say that right? Anna Kaona. Uh, Anna Ko Kaona. There mm -hmm. we go. Behind the Mountains, Eight Days, The Last Mapu, uh, mm -hmm. Mama's Nightingale, which I think I have here somewhere. Yes, I do. For those of you who have children, please get this one. Um, My Mommy Medicine and Untwine, as well as Travel Narrative After the Dance, A Walk uh, Through Carnival in Jacmel. And this conversation, we're going to uh, speak on all things, but primarily we wanted to center the conversation on folklore, spirituality, and storytelling. And who better, who better on planet Earth right now then Adwij Dantakat. So thank you so much for being here with us. I'm so grateful for your space, your time. Um, and I guess I'll start with, um, how are you? What are, how are you feeling right now? How are you, it's a, it's a intense moment in the country, but there's also a lot of change that people are feeling in this time. And so um, what are you contemplating? How are you feeling right now? Um, I'm feeling I'm feeling all right. You know, the last couple of months have been so difficult for so many people, including some loved ones. You know, so many of us have had people in our lives be unwell or, you know, or pass away. So I'm and I've had some um, people close to me uh, pass away. So it's been like that process of mourning in place, you know, without the community, the way that we used to. Um, you know, with what just uh, happened with the inauguration, there is a sense of a bit of relief because, as you know, in, in our community, there's just so many people who are living immigration-wise on pins and needles, you know, on top of everything else that they're facing. And, and I could see that some of them are um, a little bit, uh, breathing a little bit easier. I, I think so much of um, a young woman that you know, um, Christina Pontier, who I interviewed right before um, the election for, for a piece I wrote in the Miami Herald. And she, her whole like childhood had been, has been spent advocating for her family to stay together through TPS and, and um, from the Family Action Network, their, their own. And they've been so wonderful. And everybody who works in immigration in this community that you know so well, you know, we've sort of exchanged texts and be like, you know, we're just cautiously optimistic. And one of the one thing that um, Christina had said to me when we were writing the article, she said, you know, um, we want them to keep their word. And and different words were said to different people. And and I think this is one thing I've learned from you and the work that you were doing, you've been doing in the communities that, you know, the 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 battle doesn't end, you know, the, the struggle isn't over after one election or one turnover is that we still have to continue to work in our communities. We still have to 
work with the people we see every day. So I think that's that's how I'm feeling that that there's, you know, we're breathing a little bit easier, but we can't just suddenly feel like it's over, you know, that that we have to continue to for little girls like Christina and so many others who who have been fighting for so long for not just on immigration, but so many other issues in our communities. Mm, I um I will never forget well one let me first say your birthday was this week so yeah. everyone please send love to Edwidge right now her birthday was this week um and uh you know we're grateful for your presence your birth your mother who brought you into this planet um mm. and so that's such a I know that it's been a hard year and even the beginning of the year has come with its own challenges but I do pray that you take moments to of reprieve um to just celebrate sometimes just making it you know just yeah. the morning um and Absolutely. one of the things that i wanted to, to to address or at least bring up to everyone was um i knew that you lived in miami at the time when i was organizing uh, but i didn't really understand your commitment and your presence um in a, in a sort of uh, just holding space sort of way, like in the community and how accessible you were as a writer, someone who's like so accomplished and has done so many incredible things. And I remember when we were doing uh, actions and trying to understand a lot about what was going on um, with the developments that were happening in Little Haiti, I remember seeing you at meetings um, with you know commissioners or um, developers at the time that we were trying to push and challenge and it's one thing for you to be a writer who is in the world that discusses the issues of Haitian people in the community. It's another thing to be a community member who's super invested and um, wants to see your neighborhood or wants to see your community thrive. Uh, but I think there was, there was a degree of, of listening and active attention that you exhibited to, to the moment and what was happening. Um, and as, some, as someone that's always kind of like engaged in the movement, I don't think we often get enough time to reflect and, li and listen and intently make assessments of what's happening based off of that listening. So I, you're, you're a storyteller and I wanted to ask you, what have you learned about being an active listener um, in the world and what are some of the ways that you have maybe bettered or um, I don't know, become more in tune with the power of active listening as a, as a community member um, in society. I'm, I'm so happy that you, you see it that way because we would be at these same meetings and I would be, you're just like, you know, I'm bad, you're like, <laughs> and I was, you know, I would walk out of some of those meetings thinking, I should have said something. I should have, like, I should have made a speech, but, but I, and, and I was sometimes you're criticized for that, for like not getting up in the moment and like firing up. But for me, it was, I mean, I, you know, I live in this community for, for a reason because I, you know, and, and I know a lot of the people in the community. And so I, and, and there, you know, I felt like I would go and listen and then take from some of their voices. I would either write about it. I would do some other thing that I do better than that. But I think that it's such, it's so important of what you said, especially for people who might feel like, Oh, I'm not, you know, I, I should be, you know, I should be doing this, all of it or none of it. And it's so important. Um, and I was just reading something earlier with, um, I think that Kwame Tour had said like you just, some people will bail you out. Some people will give you a dollar. Some people will, um, will like mortgage their house to get you out. But some people will, will be in the movement for one month. Some people will be, but so I always felt like that part of my role was that active listening. And that's how I became, you know, involved with the Family Action Network just with, and, and with Christina to over the years going to these press conferences and watching her talk with her family and then contributing where I can do it best. So I think that is a very important thing for people who might be more introverted, who might be like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do it 
you know, full blast. I'm not going to be able to get in front of the crowd. I have gotten in front of the crowd sometime. But, but to be like, there's room for us too. I think that is so important to know, especially people who are thinking of contributing to this project and might have that hesitancy, who might be like, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not enough. So I think that's so, so for me, that's always been important. I've always seen my role as a kind of like, you know, quiet griot, you know, and then figuring out then how to, how to retell those stories because there's so many powerful people in our community. You know, you've, you've seen that you've worked on, you've worked with so many different groups in the community that they, they, they have strong voices and sometimes it just needs a bit of amplification in whatever way we could do it. And, and there are people in the community who were doing it like Nancy saint for example, and her dance company through dance. And there are people who were doing the spoken word through those big nights and through the community meetings. And it was all, I felt like, like we all had places where, where we could enter. And for me, that was always a very important way that I saw my role as, until you said it just now, I hadn't like thought of it verse that way, but that's active, as active listening. You know? Yeah. It was an important part of citizenship, right? Of being a, of being part of a community, of contributing to a community, of being able to listen as as well as to to speak. Yeah, I think with this project, one of the things we we wanted to kind of interrogate or push through was yes, it's called voices, and we're in a moment where everyone's being encouraged to speak and to tell their stories and to get out and and advocate. Um, but I think as someone that you know, I have we're always look, you know, we're used always the grass is greener on the other side, you know, you're always looking at um, what you could be doing or what you aren't doing. Or I don't think the who's the most vocal or the person who's the most outspoken ever feels like they're doing enough, you know, and I don't think the person who's silent and the person who's, you know, sitting back and observing and, 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 and still actively moving in other ways. I think everyone's always trying to figure out how can I get involved? What could I be doing more of? Um, and it's a big thing that we are struggling against, you know? So sometimes I think learning to have compassion with oneself is important. Mahogany in the last conversation that we did talked about, um, we talked a lot about colorism and then we started to go into what the role of storytelling has helped to play in solving a lot of the ailments we've had in the black community that sometimes we think um, the change is going to come from this immediate urgent action that happens in a moment and all of a sudden that's the revolution. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from our Haitian community around what revolution can result in, you know, um, what, the, what are the ramifications of, of, of an of a uprising um, of Black people, a violent uprising of Black people in, in, in defense of Somebody called me, sorry. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, what do you, what do you find to be powerful about storytelling um, in, in a way, how does storytelling help to activate or instigate um, or even reflect what needs to be happening? What have you seen your stories do that perhaps maybe like we're saying, uh, a protest may not do, even though that has a function and a place but what are the ways that stories reach people that you see be really effective in, in your work? Well, it's been really amazing, for example, this year, doing, especially um, during the summer, uh, doing the, the, the protest, to see people um, reconsider Haiti's role in, you know, in, in fighting like the, like white supremacy, like, at its very beginning and, and the revolution and, and that and all those issues coming up in terms of the what's happening in the contemporary. That's been really wonderful to see people writing about it. It's, you know, the work of scholars who've been talking about it for many years being brought up in that sense. And I think um, you were right to also bring up ramifications because it's not, there's, there's uh, you know, there's, you're penalized on the other side of <laughs> revolutions often. And I think even to this day, you know, Haiti um, has, has suffered from the from the repercussions of like the sort of the, the 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 punishments that it received for this revolution. But what 
is powerful, even in the moment of the revolution, right? How did that story travel? How did it travel? Like I go to, I've gone to two towns in the U.S. that's called High Thai, that, you know, that were, that were predominantly black towns that were inspired to, by, the, by Haiti after the revolution to, you know, to have taken that, that name when they were named, right? And, and how did that word travel to others who are like, there's this place, you know, Haiti, was this place at some point where if you could, as long as you could reach the shores, you were free, even if you were enslaved elsewhere. And those stories traveled somehow through storytelling, through the, and, and we tell the stories of the battles, of the women who fought, of the, the men, the great generals, but also we also tell these wonderful stories of, for example, Macandal, who is not talked about a lot, but who was, uh, who, was a revolutionary when he was burnt at the stake. There's a story that he became, you know, he became a, an insect, like he flew away. His body was burned, but he flew away. And just that, that one story, which is beyond the, you know, the official story, if you will, the written story still lives to this day, you know, still in some ways inspiring. So I think as a writer, as a storyteller, what interests me the most, especially and, uh, you know, in the space of revolution, the space of inspiration um, is those stories that are not in the books necessarily, right? And we have a, an extraordinary historian named Baina Bello, who is really wonderful at that, of bringing the, the untold stories to the surface, the stories of the women who fought, who, you know, who exerted themselves, whose influence we don't see in the books. But so that's what, that's the power of storytelling too. I mean, you know, there's, Two, I always think when I think of, of storytelling, the Zora Neale Hurston, like there's nothing like dying, you know, there's no greater agony than dying with an untold stories and, and, you know, untold stories inside of you. And then when we think, you know, I always, this is kind of like a, a very important essay for me, the Alice Walker essay in search of our mother's gardens, where she talks all these, imagine all our mothers, all who just who, who wanted to paint but they, but they couldn't because they were enslaved because they had these other, but, but they grew their gardens and they, you know, and they made their quilts and they, you know, this, so this, this is, that's the power of the stories and night, night, maybe they told the stories to their children, which are passed on to us. So the, the power of the story itself, you know, it's the John Didion. we tell the stories in order to live and, and, but in now, and, and many of our cultures, you know, the stories are passed on you know, we, we receive them from elders and, um, and we try to make the most out of it. And, you know, in my family, when we repeated a story, like if I read a story in a book that my mother knew and I, and I retold it to her, she'd be like, no, that's not it. And she would retell me that, that she would retell it to me. And it always seemed to me, and maybe that's why I ended up becoming a writer because I was told so many stories too, but it always felt to me like you were told that story so you could pass it on. Like, it's like the Morrison, this is a story to pass on, this is a story not to pass on. You were told that story to share. It wasn't meant to be, to be kept inside of you. And, then, and I've had this experience so many times of having been told a story that I'm, when I'm living a moment in my life, I realized, oh, that's why I was told that story. That's what it meant. You know, I, I write one of those stories in uh, Brother, I'm Dying about a woman whose father has died. And, and then she, you know, she's like, I want him back. And then this, this elder from her community comes and says, I will go to the land of the ancestors and bring him back to you. And then when the, when the, when the elder goes to the land of the ancestor, the father says, no, I'm not supposed to come back. This is not the order of things, you know, and please tell her for me that le moun vivant, moun vivant, le moun mouri, moun mouri. When one is alive, one is alive. When one is dead, one is dead. And that through, I was told that story when I was so young. And when my father died, I was like, oh, that's why I was told that story. So that I could, so that I could at some point in my life accept this unacceptable thing of losing a parent. So I mean, there's so much power, I think, to, to the stories. There's so much evolution to them as you, as you go throughout your life. And I found them to be for me like post, you know, my, you know, different post to where I, when I encounter, like, I needed this, I, I've got it. And that's why, you know, Zora, I mean, who's Zora Neale Hurston is, who's imp so important to, to both of us. There's so, so much of, you know, what she says about folklore and stories and her search for stories 
that I think is so powerful um, in, you know, in, in what we do. But, you know, two more things about stories that for me has been very powerful is that I've had two very different kind of calls to stories. Um, I remember after Kika came out, someone, a friend of mine who was a dean at a law school here at FIU, called and said, I want you to come speak to these immigration lawyers um, about storytelling. Because, because, and because she said they, when they're in front of the judge, they have to tell this so story, this very hard and difficult story of someone who has maybe five minutes to convince this judge that this horrific thing is happening to them. And the, the, the lawyers needed to know how to tell that story. And I've been, you know, and, and with young psychiatrists who, I was invited to a medical school and to tell, to tell these young psychiatrists, there might be women who are coming from Haiti who they're not gonna volunteer their stories and how do you pull the story out of them? So there are also these very, I think, very important and um, very daily used to stories that are, that are quite powerful as well. Yeah, I want to um, lift up Community Justice Project because that's how I start. It wasn't until working with Mina and Alana and the whole team that I learned, um, you know, the 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 need um, for the work that we do in a real way in the world. Uh, you know, based on helping to advocate and helping to amplify, um, but also to be a support system because a lot of times when when folks who are who have been done wrong by the system or by um, authority or by you know their landlords, et cetera, they they come to you with some sort of hope of being served or some sort of hope of being you know their case being won, having someone in their corner. But a lawyer is doing so much to you know work on the legal language and how to manipulate that legal language in the efforts of whatever the case may be that it's not often that they get to sit with the client and really go into how to, how to document a story, how to document their story, um, how to support them in telling their story. And it wasn't until the justice project and the work that we did with little farm that made it possible for a poetry for the people in little Haiti to exist. That's what, what it came out of was realizing there's such a need to, to document um, folks stories and to learn that, our grappling with law is around language, you know, uh, and the way language is weaponized against our people um, is a big part of our struggle. So, you know, what you're doing and what you've done with storytelling is so crucial to that. There's a sister named Regine who's a friend and she, uh, I asked her if she had any questions. She's from Haiti. And um, she said, I'd like to ask uh, Edwidge about her relationship with Haiti it's a tumultuous love affair being Haitian. What was her journey with this? And does she feel that she's reached a place of acceptance? It's hard to articulate, but however she could speak to uh, this relationship with Haiti would be great. Um, and so I wanted to just leave room for you to speak on that, you know, tumultuous love affair, your homeland and knowing the beauty, but also the undercurrents of the struggle. I mean, uh, the, the, the place is tumultuous at times, but my our love affair is never tumultuous. Um, I my love affair with Haiti is one that is ongoing and will never end. And in part, I think my a big chunk of my heart is always in Haiti, but a big chunk of my family is too at the same time. So whatever is happening, you know, in the news, I you know, I hear very directly how it's affecting people I know, people, you know, in, in my family, some who have chosen to stay, some who are, you know, who are there um, because that's, you know, that's where, that's where they are. Um, so it's, I've gone, I mean, maybe as you've gotten older, there's a point in everybody's migration, certainly in my migration. I remember when I was about, when I took about 25 years old, which is like, uh, you know, I'm, twice plus that age now. And I realized at 25, like, oh my goodness, I am, I'm, you know, the time that I spent in Haiti will always be that one number. And then the time that I'm spending other places is growing. So of course, then there's a, there's a shift in, 
and so much definitely how much I know. And I have, you know, I'm, I'm from this kind of family that, you know, sometimes people want to make you like an expert on something or like I've, I've always, I'm come from this kind of family where if I, if I'm trying to like sound too much, like I know everything about Haiti, they're like, I can see she dies, she dies. <laughs> there's always, there's always someone there who be like, oh, please, please want to be my side. You know, it's like, you're crazy. That's not it. Like I'm always sort of super corrected by the people in my family who are still in Haiti. So, so I know that I sort of am second to the, to them in, in that sense, because they want that, you know, that hierarchy, some of my relatives do. But I, you know, I love Haiti and we've gone as, um, as much as, as we've been able to. My mother-in-law has, a, we, we have, you know, some things we do as a family there. She has a, a school in the area where she is and my girls have gone quite a lot and, um, you know, it's it's something that I that I certainly want to to pass on to to my daughters. And I'm really, you know, we always tell this story since this is storytelling that my my daughter hates. You know, so, but it's it's a funny story. My little one, Layla, you know her. It's like my flamboyant one. She um, so when she was like really little, we had just tra everywhere she traveled was like she thought was New York because, which is very similar to when we're in Haiti. Like I thought every place in the United States was New York. So one day we're like, I think she's five and we're in Haiti on a really rocky road and sort of this really rural place. And she looks around, she looks around, she's like, this is not New York. <laughs> so for her, it was like, and, and one of the things that I wanted for my girls too with Haiti, I just wanted them, to, I wanted Haiti to be this place that they felt very connected to, but like every other place too that they traveled to, that it just was, was, at the same time, because I think Haiti is made sometimes, it's like, you know, the children in the diaspora, diaspora children of Haiti, we, we grew up with this, with our parents saying, you know, Haiti is so wonderful, it's the best, don't go, right? <laughs> like they'll say, it's great, it's great, but don't go, not the right time. And I think so, that's where the tumultuous thing comes in too, is that you're all, you know, there's always that that pull and tug. But I, I wanted my girls to have a kind of ease. It's very, I mean, there's so many, there's so so much difficulty right now. You know, there's um, there've been protests the the last couple of days. Again, the the, the tumultuous part too might come from having your heart like always on on edge for 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 the country for you know for for the rulers that we have who really are not ruling in the best interest of the people for for the suffering, but. It is such a beautiful, uh, such a beautiful place with with really wonderful people and just a, a vitality in the arts, you know. And, and talk about storytellers, you know, storytellers from the tap taps, <laughs> you know, to you've been so so yeah, and you've uh, been a very difficult time too. Yeah, yeah. Haiti, Haiti for me is still one of my favorite places in the world. Um, you know, like there's there's no place like it I, obviously there is um there's struggle and suffering everywhere and there's pain and there's you know things that you you you're heartbroken by everywhere um but i don't i don't i didn't feel a tumultuous but i'm not from you know haiti so i wouldn't know how to speak to that question but i do know that us grapple with uh especially those of the of the diaspora that live in the States, you know, that we grapple with what it means to be here and watch the ones we love struggle there and, and um, to feel like that in-between, that place of the in-between. And I think that that's something that um, I wanted to ask you about as well. But before I got to that, there was a question I had around your first, your first novel, I believe uh, Breath, Eyes, Memory was your first novel. Um, you know, it deals a lot with the value of uh, virginity or the ideas around that and innocence and, um, you know, all uh, women's bodies and, and a woman's understanding of relationship to herself, her mother. Um, you know, women's bodies often end up, even when we deal with the work that we're doing in and on the continent right now, that women's bodies often end up being the front lines for colonialism and the ways that it manifests in people. Um, and I wanted to ask you, do you see a change in Haiti and an evolution, uh, 
even in the diaspora and how we are dealing with black women's sexuality um, and gender expression and what or and if and or what more can be done? Um, what stories do you hope to be told that can help um, to really transform our relationship to black women's sexualities um, at home in Haiti, but also abroad, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I couldn't speak too specifically to the issues of sort of how uh, sexualities is in Haiti right now, because I, I, I of course, so I don't think it, it would be monolithic, because on the, on the one end, you have also a lot of very uh, religious people who, who that, so that, you know, that whatever the way women's bodies are viewed might be actually more guided by that, by the fact that you or you know you're a church person more than say culture first per se and of course it's very different and you know in certain rural areas than 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 in cities it's certainly not you know even um for the time of my of breath eyes memory this issues uh, this issue of virginity it was still i mean and i think a lot of people i got in a lot of trouble <laughs> over that because when you when you sort of write from um like from a place like I do, people think like you're talking for everybody. So the everybody I was supposed to be talking for, a lot of the folks got mad at me. But that was never the intention. It was kind of this family that had this certain value that they wanted. You know, they were sort of, uh, you know, that was that was this very specific thing about them. And I think also that's the that's something that happens when um, in in this notion of storytelling of right like whose stories are you telling? I'm telling the stories that I know of people that I know, which may be very different to, to other stories. But I think um, the bot women's, black women's bodies as battlefields, if you will. I think I, my uh, friend Asian Josh Charlotte wrote a whole book about it. I, I don't know if she was the Asian who asked here, um, but it's, it's, um, we have that vulnerability everywhere we have, you know, we have that vulnerability here. And recently, for example, you know, there, there've been a lot of kidnappings um, in Haiti. And when young women are taken, there was a, a, a very uh, tragic case of a young woman who, who was kidnapped and then her body was dumped on the street. And then there was a, um, and there've been other young women who were kidnapped, some of them released, but this young woman tragically, passed away and this was a case that everybody was talking about. Um, and then, but there was also the issue of how her body was treated, how it was through broadcast, the, the, the view of it and, and, and where she was placed and the people who, you know, and, and it became a sort of symbolic of, of what was happening, the insecurity in the country. So often, and, and during the 90s um, when there was a coup, one of the ways that you know rape became a, a political crime, so it's a, a way of of you know of assaulting a family, right? And so it's uh, you using women's bodies as a as a kind of as announcements of violence, as fields of violence. I think that's um, that's not limited to um, to Haiti, especially black women's bodies, right? Even if you think of it on the level here of of just this notion that we feel more pain. I think of that doctor, right? Who, who that's, that's a kind of extreme violence of talking uh, as well, of just people feeling like we have, you know, we, feel, we, we don't feel as much pain as others. And, and, and our girls being, you know, seen as more, you know, sexualized than, than other little girls. So it's a, it's a lifelong um, thing that, um, and that book is sort of, I was, I was going at it in one, maybe this very one specific um, way, but there's just so many ways and so many different parts of the world that, that we can deal with that, especially black and brown and indigenous um, women's bodies. Yeah, I want to um, lift up that I know we're all so many, it's not unique to, to Haiti. Um, and I do see that there are things that are happening that black women and queer folks and gender expansive people are doing um, in 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 all over the all over the world uh, to push and shift the culture and I do think that um, storytelling and 
your it, even if that wasn't what you intended from that story, it paved the way perhaps for another um, young girl to tell a story that was not going to be told or not be listened to. Um, Absolutely, because for me, like be I wrote that book really, what made me feel brave enough to write that book is reading Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. And the fact that she talked about her childhood rape, you know, her, her abuse. And I, and I remember after reading that, like, looking her up, you know, in the, in the library, we didn't have the internet. Then. <laughs> and, and then seeing, I was like, oh my gosh, she's out in the world, you know, I think, and living her life and being glorious. And I think that's also part of that, like going on a journey with, you know, unfortunately, there's so many people who don't get to go on that journey because they're, you know, they're, they're disappeared, they're murdered, and their, their bodies are, are, are destroyed. But there's also this other st side of the story when someone crosses over, you know, and they survive, they take so many of us with them, because we can look at that and see possibility for ourselves. And I think that's a very powerful thing that stories do too. And, and people, when, when people's stories are erased, so much of them is erased, you know, they're, they're, they're stripped of so many things. So I think that's also the power. And, and that's one thing I would say to people who are like sitting and thinking about contributing to this or submitting, but might be shy about it. It's like, if, you know, if you're crying while you're writing that thing, it's, that's, you know, that's important too. That's a kind of healing. And sometimes there's a, there's a kind of writing that we have to do to get to the other writing. That, that there's like a big rock in front of you that if you don't like carve your way through it, you're not going to see what's on the other side. And there might be very powerful things on the other side. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that because I think when I look back at some of the writing I wrote when I was in a space of more, much more trauma or trigger, um, you know, I look back and I'm like, oh my God, how did I write that? It was horrible. What was wrong with me? You know, but had I not flushed that out and gone through that, um, I wouldn't be at the place where I am now. And I think that that's uh, that crossover that you're talking about is a really profound metaphor. Speaking of crossovers or crossroads, I wanted to ask you about spirituality in, um, in, in, in the ways that like storytelling can kind of be shamanistic. Um, primarily, you know, one of the questions that we've had, we have a bunch of prompts that we've created and this project is called Voices. Um, not that this is gonna be like a, a, a weird, like you have a mental health issue because you're hearing voices, but um, I do think that there are ways that the Western world kind of demonizes or um, diminishes the, 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 the struggles we have, the interior struggles we have with spirit uh, mm -hmm. and trying to make sense of that when we come to a, a, a language or a place that is not ours. And I wanted to ask you, as someone who knows, who speaks multiple languages and who thinks of maybe things in different ways because of that, um, what voices come to you when you write, when you sit to write? Whose voices do you feel you carry with you? Um, and, and how have you learned to listen to those voices, to tune in and tune out? You know, like what are, I guess I wanted to, to know if that is something that resonates with you. Oh, very, very powerful, very powerfully. And sometimes it's, you know, it sounds like a little, to, to some people it sounds, uh, maybe a bit like uh, have you know lofty if you say like I'm a vessel like I you know I've often written things that I feel like oh where did that come from you know when actually my when my mother when she um, read Breath Eyes Memory uh, when I you know I started writing when I was 18 she's like how'd you know this stuff <laughs> you know she she maybe she meant the sex stuff I don't know but <laughs> but I you know and um, and create dangerously there's a, a chapter I not but called chasing chasing ghosts I think oh, yeah. gosh, embarrassing I forget the title but but it's something it's it was very interesting for me to write in, the, in this way because of, of this so it's Basquiat and um, and uh, I'm, I'm like blanking out but it's Basquiat in a Haitian artist um, and the Haitian artist was um, 
I think Philomena a bit, was he had this, you know, he was asked to join the Santo Ada, to move away from his neighborhood, to um, become an artist. But he was a Vodou priest. Mm. And he said, you know, he said, I have to ask the spirits permission to paint. And if they say no, I can't paint. And, um, and so, and he was as prolific as Basquiat. Like he painted on every surface. And then Basquiat has that painting, Chasing Ghosts. And I, and I, and I felt like in that, the, the spiritual in that, one of these guys, um, they both ended up dying young, but one had sort of come to terms with the fact that he was inhabited by something to, in order to produce this work. And another, I think Basquiat was, it manifested in some of the work, you saw it, but was kind of like, did not surrender in a way to it, right? It was kind of like two different approaches. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is an element of, to, to um, art, that's like a trance, you know, like when it's going well, when you, 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 when you're working and then you just look up and you're like, what did, the day go, or you were definitely somewhere else. And, and there's so much of it that happens on your subconscious. And for me, sometimes writing feels like a kind of prayer. It's, it feels like a kind of visit. You know, when I was writing um, Brother, I'm Dying, I would every day, you know, my father had just died in immigration custody here, and my dad had uh, pulmonary fibrosis. The two of them had just died. And literally, I would feel like when I sat down every day to write that book, I had never written a book so fast in my life, but I felt like they were with me. I, it, there's a kind of continuity. Like I feel, sometimes you feel like you can, um, we can write, like I can write my mother back into existence. And for that moment, she's with me. She, and except in the writing, she can be a little girl with me. She can be 30 with me. <laughs> she, can be, she can be the way she was with me when I held her hand as she was dying. So I, I, there's a way that I feel like the, the, the writing sometimes travel through us and then at other times we travel through it, you know, and I think that's the, that's the spiritual part of it. That is a calling, an invocation, right, of, of, of just uh, being elsewhere. It's hard to explain as you, as you said, but, but, but I think it's something that it's better that if we, if we accept it, right, that we, that we are on a journey and we're not alone. And that's one of the things that my mother also used to, to say is that like, you know, you, like you don't have to do everything by yourself. And, and then it's really powerful when you realize, and I feel like I've realized it more through art than anything else, that you are never by yourself. You know, that you are in a, that again, back to the mother, you know, our mother's gardens, you're part of this continuity. And sometimes you don't know all the people who are behind you, who've come before you, but you are never by yourself. And, and even if you think of it as just like the sisterhood that walks beside you, and, and I'm honored that you're part of that for me. And everybody who, you know, and, and V has been, you know, we've done things together before and all the, you know, so it's that part of it that's in which you, you know, things enter in which you are not alone for me is very powerful, even in my life beyond writing. Mm, yeah, that's such a good segue to the next question I want to ask you. But then another question popped up that's more technical. So I'm going to do that. And then there's the sisterhood question. So the, the technical question, you said that the brother, the, 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 which book did you say was the shortest that you ever wrote? It's time, in terms of time. Brother, I'm dying. Brother, I'm dying is the shortest in terms of time. How short was it? And what's I'm it was it wasn't like Zora Neale Hurston's nine weeks their eyes were watching <laughs> it wasn't that it was like it was six months okay. yeah it was six months and with working with a lot of documents you know uh, you know to all praise to American for Immigrant Justice we had to do a lawsuit to get the papers from the government to to write the you know so I can document that that story but um, it was really the the that's also this other part of when the way we tell our stories, right? Because sometimes we're working with um, individual trauma and collective trauma at the same time, right? Because when my uncle died in immigration custody alone, like shackled to his bed at 81 years old, 
that's that's also something that you couldn't do alone but when once i wrote that that story was written and the book came out i realized how many people were on that 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 had happened to right who who could not come out and tell their story because their status you know they 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 were undocumented and and so forth so that's also that thing of of um you imp- you might be empowering other people by telling your your own story you might be giving them a tool um you know before a judge before a journalist before a doctor so i think that's that's also something to remember and just as we talked about the sort of like the the, the daily use of 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 stories that's um wonderful thank you for that i wanted to ask you to kind of speak to this not aloneness um that i think a lot of black women in general feel but people everywhere uh what has sistering and solidarity looked like for you um the moments where you feel that maybe you have struggled or faced challenges in what ways have um those around you in your life shown up and what i think what are some of the characteristics of solidarity that has really um transformed maybe your suffering or your pain or your heartache into a uh, community collective like healing you know i wanted to ask you about that yeah well it's really i mean i think it's it's powerful this this uh, just having people in your life and i think a lot of us are learning that right and how much we we miss people and i'm i'm an introvert and i and i sort of like my dream thing was always like oh i can sit in a closet with a lamp and read my book <laughs> but but you, i did that i mean i i had that feeling still with um with the knowledge that there was i still had community right like when i came out of that place then there would be people around and i think you get to a point and you you might i mean i would love to hear your view on that too but you might you get to a point sometimes where people see you in the newspaper or if they see certain things about you they they assume that you're always fine right they assume that you're you know that they they assume that you're just like you're doing okay because your book is like out there or something and so thank god for those for the for that sisterhood that goes hey checking on you you know and um and no matter what's happening who even people who might even understand that that that's sort of the that that thing of the spotlight is not always healing right it's not always like like soul nourishing necessarily right and so um even though we're grateful for what it means for what it you know for for how it gets our work to the people who need to see it but it's it's just like those people in your life who you can check in with um who I think that's really powerful and I think a lot of us have also figured out now during this time um who those people are and um and what they do for us and we might have taken them for granted before <laughs> I think that's the or um so but but it's very it's it's a very it's it's I think that we've realized that we can't do all this alone right it's um there's in the speed of life there's an illusion that we were but we might have just been skipping around kind of like from from you know place to place that we needed to be yeah that's so so true i think um this time has really i pray that this time has grounded folks in what really matters um and this is probably going to be the last question so i want to say thank you for your time and feel free to you know um take your time answering it but I wanted to ask you what is advice that an elder a uh, woman uh, has given you in your life that you have had to use um I know you mentioned a story that you know your your father told you I believe um but I was thinking about what are some of maybe the folklore stories or traditions that something that maybe was passed on to you um even if it's just a little hint of a saying that you had to use and on a moment that that you may not have thought you were going to have to use it and how was it useful for you um because i think that that's one of the things that we forget when we're younger is that you know 
the the elder women in our life, our grandmothers, our aunties, sometimes they seem a little harsh. And they're like, you got to do this. You got to do I think of that that uh, piece from Jamaica Kincaid, Girl. Girl, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, but, you know, she's telling you the truth as much as it's like that hardcore truth. So what are some of the hardcore truths that elder women have shared with you that may have been useful for you in your life as you've matured as a woman in the world? Oh, I mean, so many, you know, starting with the stories that I was told when I was a, uh, a little girl, um, you know, my, uh, to when my mother was dying, where she, she would try to, and I, th I think that was an act of mothering at the end, you know, she would, she would just like throw proverbs at me, <laughs> but but one starting, I remember when I was really younger, my mother was so protective that whenever I didn't want to do something like I was scared of in the world, I would then go to her and 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 hope that she would say, "Oh, you know, Pete, you don't have to do that." Like driving, like I was terrified to drive, and I would present like my and my dad was forcing me. I presented to my mother, and I said, "You know, I I feel like I." I told I remember I told her I said I I'm gonna feel like I'm 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 barely the highway with like a a, a deadly seven thousand ton thing. She's like life is full of risk, child. <laughs> and I'm like this is the same woman who was like you can't go to the corner store without your brother. <laughs> so it's, she like never allowed me to, and I felt like that was really a powerful gift. It was like she. When I was starting making my own decisions, she never allowed me to be afraid on her account, mm. right? And and I think sometimes we're like we're so concerned about like this is what this person is going to think. This is what, and it's a very powerful lesson for me in my life, even with my daughters, to not like to not be the reason they're afraid, right? And and even though like I'm telling you, I had to be I had to be escorted by my brother's places, <laughs> but once that once once I was on the job, she was like, uh oh no, like this you know you've got to do you've got to do this and and but also at the end of her life, you know, at both my at the end of both my parents' life too, I, my my mother at the end of her life would say you know things to me like. Um, you know, she went to like come out with her, her, her favorite proverb was piti piti zoiseau fenish. Little by little, the bird builds its nest. Mm. And she was saying it is even as, you know, her nest was becoming undone really. And it was, and it was, uh, she was leaving me. So I, and then I think of other elders, you know, I, people who you might know, you know, like um, Paul Marshall and, and, and Toni Morrison. And I, and I tell these stories not to name drop, but it's just because it it's it's so important when like someone sees you. And I remember I wrote about it after Toni Morrison died when um, she invited me to go to to Paris when she was in residence for a month at the Louvre, and I had just had Mira, my oldest, and I was sick when when her assistant called, and I felt like. And then I felt, you know, and, and part of me too was like, what am I gonna say to like in front of Toni Morrison and and then she, um, after I said, and I was like, no, I said no out of total fear, right? And then the next day she called and I said, I'm kind of sick and I have a baby. She's like, the thing is in six months and <laughs> <laughs> you won't be sick then and your baby will be bigger. <laughs> you know, and then, and then she said, you know, what will you need? And then I told her, I said, I'm going to need all, you know, I'm going to need my husband, my mother, my mother-in-law. Because that's really how I was getting through. It was a very hard time. And so, and that happened, you know, and I, and that's also an important thing to sort of like reach back, that, that notion of reaching back and, and taking somebody, somebody with you. And this was sort of like, you know, someone I, I, I worshiped. So it doesn't have to be, I think kindness also is so, is so important in terms, and, you know, and just like seeing this idea of being, this notion of being seen and not just seeing being seen for whatever you have whatever you've done but for the for your soul like for the person that you are i think that's that's really most of the women who from nikki giovanni who i saw that you have that fabulous conversation with she, we name drop you for sure <laughs> we name drop each other that's our thing <laughs> to uh you know to to sonia sanchez most of these like these giants um 
when you sit with them, and this, you've said this so many times, and I love that because this idea of sitting at the feet of our elders, right? I'm, I mean, I'm not, I don't want anybody sitting at my feet yet. I'm not quite that elderly yet, but it's something that I have always like loved to have had the opportunity that we, you know, we've been so blessed to have had the opportunity to also be at the feet of these wonderful elders in our communities and and the and the fabulous young people like yourself so yeah I, you know, you know, I feel you're that for me so I think that I look to you and I know that you have you you might think of yourself in a way that you don't realize that's not how I see you so um, <laughs> you know sometimes uh we just by being present and just showing up and responding and um it's a lot. It does so much for, for, for other women and girls. And I've learned that in myself and, and how I try to just be present. Um, and when you, t like you said, when you tell your stories, it, it makes more room for another woman to tell her story. And so I just wanted to thank you for accepting to do this. I know a lot of women um, look to you and the work that you're doing. And I know that it's been a, a, a tough time, a tough, time these past few months and year but um just to know that there are so many women that are carrying whatever you're going through with you even if we don't know the depth of it um because we're all carrying those things as well in our own ways and so just thank you for for you and thank you for all that you've done and um and the boundaries you put up too you know because it teaches it's taught me how to create more boundaries in my life as well so i think you know, those are these. There's ways that we move in the world that that are examples that we sometimes don't even realize. Um, and so I just want to say that. And I know that V is watching, and I want to say thank you to V. Um, and I'm just grateful thank to be <laughs> this is good to be to be learning and uh, in movement with you all. I appreciate you so much. Um, please, everyone. I'm praying. Are you going to keep this account? <laughs> are you going to keep this? Account? We'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, everyone, well, everyone, you don't have to feel pressured to do anything on it, but I will tell you, please go follow the Rosa <laughs> account because she might end up using it again. You never know. Um, and we want to make sure that we're supporting her. We know that that's where she actually is. The other account is not hers. So um, there's that. And please, if you, have, if you know of a, a Black girl, Black woman who has a story to tell, um, encourage them to go to vsforvoices.com. If they are not someone who is literate or works with words or considers themselves an artist or poet, consider helping them sit down and write and tell their story as well. Um, we do believe in the power of oral history and uh, helping each other carry each other's story. And so I want to thank you all for tuning in and for listening. Um, and for bringing another sister into this conversation, I pray. And um, Edvige, my love to you, to the family, to your husband, to the girls. Tell the girls thank you because they looked out and helped you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I will. They said to say hi to you. <laughs> yeah, anytime they need to say hello or give a call, let me know. I'm here. All right. Well, we're still, we're still waiting for you here. <laughs> yeah, I'll be back. I'll be back soon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, let's see, how do I get this? Ending now.